Johnny's mother stops to watch her son read the Bible to her cat, and she thinks to herself, this is so tender and touching. But about an hour later, she hears a terrible screeching racket outside, and she runs out the door to find Johnny stuffing that same cat into a bucket of water. <laughs> she says, Johnny, what in the world are you doing? And Johnny said, I'm baptizing Muffin. <laughs> but Johnny, cats don't like to be in water. And Johnny said, well then, she shouldn't have joined my church. <laughs> Commitment. If it's necessary to a member, it's imperative for a minister as well. Pastors and leaders have been called to care for God's flock, must be doubly dedicated and deeply disciplined because tough times are going to arise. And there will be the faint-hearted folks who will want to whine and wimp out and walk away from the church and the ministry. We're told in the late 1800s that the preacher's preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, in his book, Lectures to My Students, wrote these words, do not enter the ministry if you could help it. If any student in this room could be content to be a newspaper editor, a grocer, a farmer, a doctor, a lawyer, or a senator, in the name of heaven and earth, let him go his way. For he's not the man in whom dwells the Spirit of God in its fullness. For a man so filled with God will weary of any pursuit but that for which his inmost soul pants. There has to be a panting. There has to be an undeniable passion that pushes you on. Because people will cause you untold problems and create insurmountable pressures, and you will be tempted to say, that's it, I'm done, I'm walking away. And that's pretty much the place where a young pastor named Timothy was at when Paul penned two epistles to his fine friend. We're looking at the first in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Ephesus was not an easy place to minister. The city was not the paragon of purity. Just to remind you of the caliber of characters that were present in that ancient town, turn back a few pages to chapter 1 and look at the folks in verses 9 and 10. Paul writes, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but it's made for those who are present in that city lawless, rebellious, ungodly, and sinners, the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers and murderers, immoral men, homosexuals, kidnappers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Sounds like a lovely lot to minister to, doesn't it? And then there were the legalists who dogged his steps in chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. And the apostates that we met last week in chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. And of course, there were the gossiping giddy gals whom we'll be introduced to in chapter 5 and verse 13. Now, I count in six chapters of 1 Timothy, 14 references to problem people in the congregation. And if that wasn't enough, he was being antagonized because of his age. Look at chapter 4 and verse 12. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity, show yourself to be an example of those who believe. Now, the action in the original language prohibits an activity already taking place. Timothy was being despised. And Paul says, don't let them push you around because you were young. Most likely he was 30. And when you're 30 years of age, you don't get a whole lot of respect in the ministry. You know, as I've told you, I save all the messages I've ever preached. And some of the messages that got me into lots of trouble when I was in my early 30s, I've tried preaching again in my 50s, and people absolutely love them. 
The difference was not in the message, it was in the age. People struggle with listening to ministers who are younger. And Timothy was going through that. And Paul says, don't let them push you around. He was entertaining jumping ship. He was thinking of quitting. For verse 14 says, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you. It's a process that was already taking place according to the grammar. He was neglecting the gift. Do you know why he was sidestepping his pastorate? Why he was backing off when it came to the power in the pulpit? Because Timothy was afraid of what people would think. And that's why Paul writes in 2 Timothy 1.7, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Years ago in Italy, there was a 77-year-old man who all of a sudden quit breathing. Doctor was called in, and he examined the patient carefully, and the man was pronounced dead when they discovered there was absolutely no pulse. So naturally, he was taken to the local morgue, laid out on the table, and just before they took that beautiful scalpel to open him up, he woke up, and he looked around the room, and he said, where am I? Who are you? To which the mortician nonchalantly replied, well, you're in a morgue, and I'm an undertaker. Man had a heart attack and fell over dead. <laughs> True story. That's what fear does. Fear opens the door for failure. So don't entertain it. Paul's words to his protege apply to all those of you in this church who have any position of influence of leadership in the local assembly. It applies to elders and deacons. These words apply to Sunday school teachers and Bible study leaders and heads of ministries. And Paul offers three indelible insights for all those who seek to lead in the church. Insight number one, Seek to be an example to the saints. Verse 12, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in their speech and conduct and love and faith and purity, show yourself as an example to those who believe. Now, the word example, tupos, is actually a figure formed by an impression. A figure formed by an impression. And it takes me back to the time when I was working at the terminated files in the basement of Allstate Insurance many years ago. When times were slow and we had a break, we would engage in these full-scale rubber band wars down in the basement. And we'd load up two or three of these major rubber bands and shoot them at one another. And my friend said that years before, they used to do that with open paper clips. They would put the paper clip back and aim for the person and let it fly. Until one day, a guy stuck his head out from a file cabinet, and it got hit right in the cheek with the paper clip, and he had the impression of that paper clip on his face for the next month. And that's what Paul is saying. Be a tupos, imprint yourself on the lives of others, let your life be like a paper clip on that fella's face something they can't shake off, something they're forced to take with you wherever they go. Model it in your speech and your conduct and your habits and your walk and your talk. Seek to do it right. Will you always do it right? Absolutely not. God knows I've had many, many failures in my life. And you're going to have failures as well. But when you make a mistake, own the mistake. Confess it as sin and move on. Don't live in shame. Don't live in guilt. Don't live in fear. Do your best to make it right and let it go. For we're told in 1 John 1, 9, as we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive the sins and cleanse us. And so we show people in godliness Godliness is not being perfect because the person who acts perfect is a phony and a hypocrite. Godliness is doing your best to model Christ-likeness, and when you blow it, 
you ask for forgiveness and move on. That's what Paul did and Timothy did and all of us have to do. And let people know that when you set your course in the ministry and you have a calling from God, absolutely nothing will deter you from that specific calling. While dealing with the problems of geography and climate in the building of the Great Panama Canal, Colonel George Gothels had to live with constant criticism from countless busybodies who said there's no way in the world you will ever finish this canal. But the resolute builder said nothing. He kept pushing on towards his goal. And a very criticism-conscious subordinate asked, aren't you going to answer your critics? He said, yes, I will. He said, how? And the great engineer smiled and said, I will answer them with the canal. And he did. And then we gave it away. <laughs> and yet giving is an essential part of the Christian life. For the verse goes on to say, be an example in love. Love says, I love you even when I don't like you. It's the word agape. It's used of God's love for us in John 3, 16, and the husband's love for his bride in Ephesians 5, 25. Demonstrate faith, which means be faithful and loyal and trustworthy to the people and the church that you're ministering to, that you will be there to sacrifice for your ministry when necessary. And while you're at it, Timothy, in verse 12, demonstrate purity. You say, that's an interesting word. He couldn't be talking about sexual purity to a pastor, could he? I believe he was. Because in 2 Timothy 2.22, Paul says, flee youthful lusts. And the present imperative means keep on running, keep on fleeing, because lust is hounding your heels. Is it possible that Timothy was struggling with some lustful thoughts and ideas? I believe he was. I think the problems that people were causing without are beginning to create pressures within, and he was beginning to weaken his purity. He was drifting in his devotion to the Lord, I think, when Paul wrote these words. Perhaps he was praying the prayer of St. Augustine, who prayed, O oh Lord, deliver me from lust, but not yet. <laughs> Timothy, don't go that route. Make purity paramount in your life. Be an example to the saints. And secondly, he says, be an exhorter of Scripture. Verse 13, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. So until you receive orders from me, Make this your top priority. For those who are in leadership in the church, and especially elders and pastors, the chief calling is to never, ever grow weary of studying and teaching the Word of God. Turn over just a few passages or a few pages to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's look at verses 1 to 2. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. And what is the charge? Preach the word. You be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. You know, when Jesus called Peter to the ministry, he asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And when he said yes, what was our Lord's response? Feed my sheep. That's the primary way a pastor demonstrates love for people. It's not hugging them. It's not counseling them. It's not even praying for them, as important as those activities may be. It's standing here Sunday after Sunday, accurately applying and declaring the truths of this holy book. 
That's the way a pastor demonstrates his love for Jesus and for the congregation. If I spend four hours in administration and counseling, which I sometimes do, I feel exhausted. If I spend eight hours preparing a message, I feel invigorated. You know why? Because that's what I'm called to do. I long for the day when I'll be able to do more and more of it. It's what I live to do. My whole life has always been about preaching. When I was called to the ministry, I was called first to the pulpit because that's the gift that God has given me, and that's what I love to do. Studying and preaching is just F-U-N. It's not work. It's fun. Unfortunately, it isn't to some people. Some folks are not that impressed by sermons and messages. The British Weekly published this provocative letter. Dear Sir, it seems like ministers feel their sermons are very important and spend a great deal of time preparing them. Now, I've been attending church regularly for 30 years. I've heard 3,000 sermons. To my consternation, I've discovered I cannot remember a single sermon. I wonder if a minister's time might be more profitably spent on something else. Well, for weeks, uh, a storm of editorial responses ensued, finally ended by this letter. Dear Sir, I've been married for 30 years. During that time, I've eaten 32,850 meals, mostly my wife's cooking. Suddenly, I've discovered I can't remember the menu of a single meal. And yet, I have the distinct impression that without them, I would have starved to death a long time ago. Paul says there's three stages that the leader is to do when it comes to exhortation of Scripture. What's the first stage in the verse? The public reading of Scripture. Let's read together what the Bible says about reading the Bible. Here we go. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. And then one more. Blessed is he who reads those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Reading God's word is super important. You need to be reading the Bible every day. And when you come on Sunday mornings, even if you forget your Bible, we put the verses up there so we can read it together. Step number two is the teaching of Scripture. What does it mean to teach the Scripture? Well, you've heard the word exposition. And what exposition means is to expose the text. That's the job of the teacher. It's like the text is clothed and camouflaged as you read through your Bible. You go, what does this mean? What's this about? And the job of the teacher is to take off the clothing and expose it and make it clear to everyone. And that's exactly what we read in Nehemiah 8. Let's read that together. And they read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. That's the exposition. Napoleon had three commands for his messengers that applied to all communicators of the word of God. You know what they were? Be clear, be clear, be clear. That's it. My mentor who raised me in the ministry, taught me how to preach in homiletics class, would tell us often, gentlemen, if there's a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the pew. If you're a little bit confused, they will be totally conflicted and they're not going to get it. And making the message longer doesn't help. Here's some signs, by the way, that you're in for a really long sermon. Are you ready? <laughs> Number one, there's a case of bottled water beside the pulpit in a cooler. It's a bad sign. 
Number two, the pews have camper hookups. <laughs> Three, the preachers brought a snack to the pulpit. <laughs> and number four, the bulletins have pizza delivery menus. <laughs> you see that? You're in for trouble. Two church members were talking. One said, I thought the sermon was divine. Reminded me of the peace of God. It passed all understanding. <laughs> The second said, reminded me of the mercies of God. I thought it would endure forever. <laughs> now, if it's interesting, the length is irrelevant. But if it's boring and confusing, three minutes is too long. Now, how do you make it interesting? How do you make sure that people will listen? Well, that question was asked of G. Campbell Morgan, the great preacher of the Westminster Chapel in the 1940s and 50s. And he said, here's the secret. It's work, it's hard work, and then it's more work. He was in his study every morning, and no one was ever able to interrupt him with any movement until 12 noon every day. That's the commitment that a pastor and a teacher of God's word has to have. Dr. Bernard Ram, the great theologian, defines the work of the good teacher. Listen carefully. The good interpreter never looks at a word without questioning a mark in his mind. He may consult his Greek lexicon or his Webster's or a commentary or a concordance, but he fusses amongst his books until the word upon which he's fixed his attention begins to glow with meaning. An experienced doctor has a wonderful sensitivity in his fingertips. He has spent a lifetime feeling lumps, swellings, growths, and tumors. He knows their textures, shapes, and peculiarities. Our fingers will tell us two things. A doctor's fingers tell him two dozen things. And that's the way it is with the Bible teacher. He or she must have a feel for words. He must pass the fingers of his mind over their shapes, textures, and peculiarities. This means sensitivity to every phrase, every clause, every paragraph, and every idiom. A good Bible teacher is restless. Next Sunday, Christine and I are going to be gone. And our brother Dave's going to be filling the pulpit, and you won't want to miss that. Because Dave is known as he's going to be gone for the past two months, and he has known for the past two months what he's going to be preaching on, and every single day he's been focusing for 60 days on this message. He has looked at the passage from every angle possible, I mean, I'm a good Bible student by nature. He has revealed to me in the study things I've never even seen in the text that he's looking at. Because he understands the price that a teacher or a preacher must pay for the privilege of getting up here. It's not just shooting off the top. Bob Windhauser, who has the gift of gab. About a year ago, when I was going to teach a class on preaching, he said, oh, I'm going to come to that. That will be an easy one. And after the first session, he said, I, I think I need to stay home. I'm not going to be able to handle this. He didn't realize how much work and effort and time and study it involves. And that's exactly what Paul is calling the preacher and teacher to do. It's a privilege to stand up here and preach. And those who do so must earn the right with hard work. So you have the reading of Scripture, you have the teaching of Scripture, and then the third part that Paul brings out in this verse is the exhortation or the application of Scripture. Now that's a word that we've looked at on numerous occasions in the past, parakaleo. Remember that word? Kaleo is to call, and para-like parallel is alongside. The preacher is called alongside the congregation to comfort, and to counsel, and to convict. Comfort, counsel, and convict. As someone has best defined the preacher's task in this phrase, it's very simple. 
He's called to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comforted. <laughs> the job is to make it practical. The job is to make you squirm. The job is not for you to walk out saying, oh, I've got it, but oh, baby, I've got it right here. President Calvin Coolidge went to church one Sunday. His wife was sick, and she wasn't able to attend. And when he got home, she asked, well, what did the preacher speak about? He said, sin. Well, what did he say about it? And President Coolidge said, I, I think he was against it. <laughs> you know, if that's all you get out of a message, I failed to communicate accurately. In fact, here's a little side note. If I say something on Sunday that is conflicting or confusing to you, that's why I've given you a note sheet. Write it down. Approach me afterwards. Call me during the week. I'll spend all the time in the world to make sure it's clear to you. Because if you don't get the heart of the message, I've failed you. I agree completely with Dr. Howard Hendricks of Dallas Theological Seminary who put it best when he said, interpretation without application is abortion. There are many teachers today who explain the word of God and do not apply it. They are giving you an aborted baby. If I don't make it clear to your life, the Word of God comes out stillborn. That's how powerful it is. And so these are important thoughts for those of us called to exhort the Scripture. Be an example to the saints. Be an exhorter of Scripture. And then number three, Paul says if you're in leadership, seek to be an exceptional servant. An exceptional servant. Verses 14 to 16. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. I've underlined three phrases that are all present, active imperatives in the Greek. Do not neglect, verse 14. Take pains, verse 15. Pay close attention, verse 16. A present active imperative, the imperative is a command, and present is always present. These are constant commands. Never give up on them. Remember, he is speaking to a minister who is thinking of tossing in the towel. And if you engage in any ministry in the church, you will get to the point where you're going to want to give up and quit. And God's word says, don't even consider it. Just stay with it. In your service to the saints, as you pray for them, as you care for them, as you minister to them, as you teach them, never say it's good enough. Always seek to do a little bit better. Be an exceptional servant. Timothy was not. Timothy was neglecting his gift, which is probably a combination of teaching, exhortation, and leadership. The gift was given by the presbytery. That's the word used here. It's the elders. At his ordination, they put their hands on Timothy, and at that point, he was fired up. But now the flame is a flickering candle. He's a candle in the wind and is about ready to blow out. And the reason why, he was frightened. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul writes in verses 2 to 4. And we will stay in 2 Timothy for just a few moments. To Timothy, my beloved son, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did as I constantly remember you and my prayers night and day. Now watch this in verse 4. Longing to see you even as I recall your tears. The ministry was breaking his heart. The ministry was making him cry. 
And he felt ashamed because of that. Look at 2 Timothy 1.8. Therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord or of me. Join with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Paul certainly wasn't ashamed. Look at verse 12. For this reason, I also suffer these things. I'm not ashamed. I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he's able to guard which I've entrusted until that day. And then 2 Timothy 2 and verse 1. You be strong in the grace of Christ Jesus. Suffer hardship, verse 3, like the soldier in the battlefield, verse 4, like the athlete in the Olympics, verse 5, like the farmer in the field, verse 6. You got to be tough. You got to stay with it. And then he says, as we turn back to 1 Timothy 4 and verse 15, he says, take pains with these things. And then we have the word in the English, which has been added by the translators, but it really carries the thought, be absorbed in these. Let them suck up your life. The word take pain in the Greek means to have a detailed plan. You don't simply stumble into an effective ministry. It becomes your lifestyle. It's far more than a job. It's who you are. I'm thinking about it all the time. I'm thinking about it at night when I'm going to sleep. I'm thinking about it in the morning when I'm doing push-ups. I'm thinking about it when I'm surfing, looking forward to hook up with someone I could perhaps share the gospel with it. I'm even thinking about it when I'm cleaning my car, something I like to do just about every day. And I live right there in the corner and tons of cars drive by me. And I always stop and wave and smile. And the reason why is because the people in my neighborhood know that I'm a pastor. And they probably see me say and do dumb things. But they also know this guy has the joy of the Lord. And I'm always thinking, I'm hoping they're thinking, I want what that guy has. As a good Christian, it's always with you all the time. It takes a lifetime to develop this ministry. And so pay close attention, verse 16, to yourself and your teaching persevere in these things. That's the Greek word epimeno. Meno is to abide. Epi is upon. It's to really abide strongly upon the task God's given you. You don't toss in the towel. You don't jump ship. You don't run like a rabbit. You don't whine and whip out. I can't take it anymore. You stay with it. You remain dedicated and committed no matter how many difficult problems may arise. Because if you stay with the task, God promises a victory in the end. Phil Mickelson knows that. His very first win of a major golf tournament was at the Masters Golf Tournament. He had a terrible first nine. He lost the lead that he had taken in the final round. But Phil had birdied four of the last five holes before dropping a dramatic putt and defeating Ernie Els by a single stroke on the 18th hole. That was Phil's day. And man, was he ever excited. He was determined that a few bad holes and the front nine would not destroy his quest for victory. You're all going to have some bad holes. You're going to make some poor putts, some inaccurate drives. You keep putting, you keep driving, you keep swinging, you keep praying, and eventually Galatians 6.9 says, God will give you an incredible harvest of joy if you don't give up. Let's bow together.